Welcome to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest today is Mark Bauerlein. After earning his doctorate in English from UCLA in 1988, he's taught at Emory University since 1989 and served as director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment of the Arts between 2003 and 2005. While there, Dr. Bauerlein contributed to an NEA study entitled Reading at Risk, a survey of literary reading in America. He's currently professor of English at Emory University and author of the 2008 book, The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Their Future. Dr. Mark Bauerlein, welcome back to Inside Academia. Good afternoon. You're uh, giving a talk at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute uh, conference in Princeton University entitled American History by Google and Wikipedia. What is the problem with the way college students and high school students these days approach and study American history utilizing things like Google and Wikipedia? Well, the first thing to realize is that American history for high school and college students today is largely by Google and Wikipedia. These are the windows onto American history for them. They use them all the time. It's their first choice. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, an education researcher typed 100 terms uh, of history uh, taken from the NAEP U.S. History uh, exam. Uh, type those 100 terms into Google. The very first entry was a Wikipedia entry in 87 out of those searches. In another 12, the Wikipedia entry came up second, and in the final one, Wikipedia came up third. Mm -hmm. which tells you that Wikipedia really is the first stop, and Google is the way that most young people get there. Uh, the popularity of Google with young people may be, uh, may be determined by the fact that Google is now the number one brand for teenagers in America today. That's a, a, a latest survey of the popular brands, and this included candy bars and fast food and everything else. Google is at the top for them. They live in a Google world. It's the first thing they do whenever they are handed a homework assignment or a research topic. Type it into Google. So what's wrong with that, I guess, is the question. That, yeah, that, well, what is wrong with that? Uh, well, one thing is that uh, these websites are enormously convenient. I mean, it's, it's fantastic that you can type a, type a term into Google and it will bring up what you need on the very first page of search results almost every time. In fact, the percentage of search results that go to the second page of Google is, uh, is, is pretty small. It's just a fraction. Uh, the top spot in a Google search takes about 40% of the click-throughs, as, as they're called. That's where people go. And that's a, an indication right there of how convenient Google is. And, and so the measure of its effectiveness is Google gets you to the source you need miraculously quick. But when you are talking about historical knowledge, when you are trying to teach historical understanding to young people, it's not just a matter of getting the information. That's not the only thing that you want to do when you have young people do historical inquiry. You want to make their inquiries follow a method that will, first of all, lodge the historical knowledge into their heads in a permanent or semi-permanent fashion. You don't want them to regard U.S. history as just a body of information that they retrieve from when they're given an assignment, and they find the right websites, cut and paste, add some commentary on their own, print it out, and turn it in. Okay. That is, is really a model of information retrieval, and the material doesn't lodge in young people's heads long enough for it to be remembered. It's just an assignment that they regard in the most instrumental terms. I mean, for a lot of them, 15-year-olds, they don't even understand what the problem is with just cutting and pasting and not even adding any commentary of their own if they're given a research topic. You know, do a paper on slavery. Well, just go to some websites, 
Wikipedia being the first one, cut a few paragraphs, put them together, and turn them in. And the teacher would say, well, wait a minute, you're, you're plagiarizing this, you're taking this material, you're not adding your own material. They say, well, you wanted something on slavery, I went and found it, and I gave it to you. Well, let me, what do you let me, want? Let me jump in there for a moment. Uh, you make a very good point about the plagiarism, and it's so easy to do now, but I think that's a separate issue, though. Uh, if I wanted to do a research on a subject, uh, I could use utilize Google or any search engine. And if I wanted to do di due diligence, I would look at more than just the first page. And I would try to at least comprehensively exhaust all of the available uh, material within reason. And I would actually have to spend the time reading it, though. And then if I do that, and then I create my own synthesis of the information, then isn't that the same sort of thing that somebody would have done 30 or 40 years ago, except I'm not spending all the additional time having to go through the card catalog in a library and doing things uh, non-electronically. So what exactly is the difference or the problem with having your sources appear quickly and immediately, uh, but, which I think is a separate issue from actually doing the work of reading the material and, think, and critically thinking about it? Right, and, and that, that's true. You're saving yourself a lot of legwork and if you're using Google and getting all the material and genuinely processing it, pulling it together, absolutely. But look, you've got to remember the motivations of 17-year-olds. They've got an assignment, and they want to complete it as quickly as possible. If they can complete the assignment without reading all those materials, well, hey, don't read all those materials. If they can have to do something like... Uh, uh, Go do a paper on something about childhood and labor and Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. Well, Dickens' novels, they can just go find on Google Books, and they can just do word searches for labor in those novels, find those little sections that have kids working, and then just extract from those and rearrange them somehow into a paper they don't have to read all of those novels. The right. shortcuts are highly tempting. Now, so now here's the problem. A, it's an accelerated shortcut, far more so than Cliff Notes were decades ago. Right. I mean, if you've got a task in the workplace, you want those shortcuts. And it really is about passing on information, creating a PowerPoint. But when you're talking about education, it is the formation of minds and dispositions. We don't care as much about the product, that 10-page paper, as we do about the intellectual impact of creating that product on the mind of that student. Okay, so it's going through the process of, it, of, of actually doing that reading and the thinking and the writing, uh, and that is what forms the mind and the intellect, uh, rather than simply taking snippets of data and information and just piecing it together as quickly as possible. Exactly. We want to think of this in terms of formation. You know, the French term for education, formation. We want to form their minds well beyond that class. So I'll give you an example of a paper topic or an assignment uh, in which Google is damaging to the learning outcome we aim for. And this is an example I'm going to give in the ISI talk. When I teach courses in American literature, sometimes I will say, I started to say to students these little assignments, uh, go look at the 14th Amendment and just summarize what the 14th Amendment says before we look at some African American literature from after the war, things like this. So one assignment I said was, go find an obituary on one of the authors that we have studied in the last two weeks, Mark Twain, for instance. So and, and summarize that. And just turning the obituary to. Well, what do they all do? They go to Google. They type in Mark Twain obituary. Now, the very ser first search result on that search is a list of obituaries for Mark Twain published in different newspapers. If you click on the New York Times obituary for Twain in 1910, what you'll get is a nice text the exact text of the obituary that appeared in the New York Times, word for word, but it's a Google page. It doesn't appear in its original context on the full page of the newspaper. Okay. So it got 
the student right there to the obituary so the student didn't have to go do that legwork that we say is so time consuming. But here's the problem with that. And I address it by having the students do the assignment again without using any computer. Okay. Now, when I say to students, okay, guys, do it again without using any computer, they, they, they get a blank look on their faces like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why? And I tell them, well, I'm doing this as a process. Right. You're focusing too much on the product and not about the activity itself and what the activity brings. So, first of all, I have to explain to them, people did find these things before Google. So, the first thing is, don't be so doggone helpless without these tools. Show a little initiative. And then I say, go to the research librarian and say, I need to find an obituary on Mark Twain. Can you help me? And I can't use a computer. Well, they would do it the old-fashioned way. They would take the student and take the student over to the microfilm room. Yeah. And the student would have to go to the microfilm, load it up, and find the obituary. Now, what is the student going to encounter in the process? Well, first of all, you have to find out the day that Twain died. So you can get that out of an encyclopedia or a biography. And then you go look at the New York Times for a couple of days surrounding Twain's death. And what are you going to see from 1910 you're going to see something about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you're going to see something about President yeah. Taft. Taft. You'll find all kinds of other interesting things along the way. It's like stack searching the the library right. rather than just rather than just typing in the the thing that you're looking for in the computer database. You're actually going into the the, the stacks into the vaults and you're. Your eyes are glazing over all these things that you never would have known about or seen had you not physically gone there. Likewise, going through the role of the microfish. I used to do that myself in looking for historical research, and I'd come across all sorts of interesting things around the same time that I never would have thought. I said, oh, wow, that's really interesting, and I'm spending all this extra time. It even comes down to advertisements, headlines, right. photographs, fashions. You see what people were wearing. You see what... Uh, you, you, you might go through the sports page and see how that was reported until finally you found the obituary itself. Right. Now, there's also an internal debate among academics, is, is that you're, I'm sure you're aware about the authenticity of a source. So, in other words, we, we're, you know, the projects now involved are, are uh, digitizing books. Many academics are debating, well, how do you know you truly can have an authentic source when you just rely on some digital copy? and uh, you didn't actually physically examine the hard, original source that, that you're looking at. But well, this, is, this is an interesting debate that, that academics are, are grappling with at the moment. But getting back to students for a moment, though, I think you're trying to impress upon them the, the, it's that it's the journey, going through the motions, not so much as getting to the end result. But as you pointed out in our previous interview, just like the exams that they take, it, everything has become so much more mercenary now than it ever was before. Likewise, not only answering the, the questions on the exams, but also in doing the papers. So if you can find the quick answers as easily as possible, the end result, the product is the proof of the pudding in their minds. And if everything else in society and the world around them is doing the exact same thing, you're like uh, fighting the current, I guess. After you made some of these students do the same assignment, uh, after they did it with Google and they went and they did the microfiche or they did it the hard way or the old-fashioned way, what was some of their um, their initial responses or reactions to it, having done it that way? I would say that in every class I teach, roughly 10% of them take the lesson and realize that the hard way, the slow way, may be the better way for them. And they will come to me and talk about this they will realize that to become an educated person requires that they spend a lot more time browsing through bookshelves, more time in bookstores, more time reading old newspapers, going into some archives and digging through some of those materials, and that their hyper-connected, digitalized, 
lives are not all they are intellectually cracked up to be. Right. In fact, a lot of them sense this. They, they, they know that, you know, these, these tools, which are often passed off as high-powered intellectual educational tools, really are just social tools, tools to ease their way through, uh, through their, their, their studies. They, they sense this. Right. But most of them, Andy, you know, they got their eye on the degree. They got their eye on the job. They do have a mercenary attitude toward their studies, and if some old fogey like me comes along and tells them, why don't you try writing your paper out with a pencil and a piece of paper before you type it up on the keyboard, right. they, they, they just look at you as, as yeah. out of touch, old fashioned, and you know the sooner they can move on, the better. The next thing you'll ask me to do is carve it into a stone tablet, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, even 50 years ago, when they did do things the pre-digital way, right? They still had to, um, you still had a lot of people that were only in it to be mercenary, only in it to go through the motions. And you always have a very small percentage of people that truly appreciate uh, the educational experience, the intellectual and personal enrichment that you get out of doing things the thorough way, the diligent way. Um, but now, uh, with mass higher education, everybody's in there just to become credentialed. Now, I think your thesis, as per our previous interview, is that just to say that technology, while it's in and of itself neutral, it's perpetuating this sort of mercenary approach to fact gathering, and re education is being reduced to this hyper exchange of factoids back and forth. Would that be a, a, a good summarization of of where we stand now? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'd have to elaborate upon that and okay. go into. Uh, the not so neutral impact of these tools on on people's lives. I mean, for, first of all, the the rise of visual imagery on websites, the increasing use of schematics, PowerPoints, bullet points, uh, a highlighted font, uh, a lot of uh, text broken up into very easily digestible pieces. That's what websites aim for. If you come on upon a website, if an 18-year-old comes upon a website that's a PDF that looks like a book, dense, you know, linear. Right, right. They don't like that. And the unfortunate thing is that they don't realize that while a lot of the digital discourse, the revolutionary digital discourse says, well, that's the old way. That's the old linear text, the old book model. The problem is that many professional spaces still rely upon the forms of reading, linear, slow, summary, the old-fashioned way. Sure. And that if you are a 22-year-old who has been so conditioned by the screen to process words fast, to cut and paste, to retrieve information, and just pass it along, to write quick, short sure. bursts of text, you are not going to do well in the world of science, medicine, law, right. academia in general. I mean, there, there, there are lots of professional zones wherein if you cultivate these hyper-accelerated digital habits, you are going to cancel yourself out from a lot of the professional ambitions that you may still have. That's right, and that was, that's what higher education was supposed to be for, those, those sort of higher uh, professional uh, aspirations. Uh, there was a book uh, recently that came out called uh, In the Shallows, which, which basically alluded to just precisely what you were just describing, how on a website you have all these million different distractions and you have to make these immediate decisions about what to click on, what to do, and all this does is serve to break up your attention span. But anyway, Dr. Mark Bauerlein, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, sir. I'm Andy Nash. This has been InsideAcademia.tv. Please join us again next week as every week as we take you for a look behind the ivory curtain.